Good afternoon, everyone. So we are starting our fifth section devoted to materials research in the scope of ERC grants. On behalf of the Board of Portuguese Material Society, I would like to thank you for attending this seminar. It is really important for us as Portuguese Material Society to recognize and re disseminate research of excellence that's, that, has, that is being carried out in Portugal in the field of materials. I would like also to thank my colleague Luis Pereira for the organization of these seminars. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Lin Ferreira from the University of Coimbra. I know him since he was a PhD student, which was about <laughs> five, six years ago. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we are getting old enough. <laughs> the time really flies. So he's an excellent researcher that has made the, a major contribution to the biomaterials field. Uh, I'm going to briefly describe his CV. So Lina Freud is an investiga investigator coordinator at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Coimbra and affiliated with CNCA Research Unit at the same university. Uh, a key focus of this bioengineering laboratory is to develop platform technologies in the area of biomaterials, drug delivery and cell therapy to address unmeted me medical needs. Uh, the lab has two main avenues of research. <clears throat> This is modeling in drug screening program based on tissue models for human stem cells and therapies based on nanomedicine platform. In the last 11 years, Lino Lab has <clears throat> done significant contributions at the interface of engineering with biology, in particular in the development of advanced nanoformulations for medical application and issues models for screening and disease modeling. I have to say that Lino has published some of his contributions in the top journals, a really important journal like Angevant Chemistry, ACS, Nano, 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 Nano Nature Communication. <clears throat> in the last 11 years, he attracted more than one, uh, 11 million euros of competitive funding, which included an euro share project, an ERC starting grant, one twinning project, two Marie Curie TN projects, and five Marie Curie International Fellowships, which are very competitive projects, so which is a clear proof of the quality of the, the work that Lino and his team is doing. So the members of his group have founded companies that have attracted more than 50 million euros in venture capital. He is the inventor of more than 20 international patents, 10 of them <coughs> licensed to companies. Uh, he has su successfully supervised 19 PG students and 14 postdocs. So it's a really impressive CV. <coughs> he is also associate editor of the journal Biomedical Biomaterial Science from the RSC. He was the recipient of several awards, including Blue Pharma Innovation in 2006 in FCT investigation twice in 2013 and 2015, the career extreme uh, career staminal prizes in 2008. He was the president of the Portuguese Society of Stem Cell and Cell Therapies between 2013 and 2015. So Lynn, thank you very much again for being with us. It's a really honor for us to have you with us today. Thank you so much, George, for uh the kind introduction and the, for the invitation for, for uh, giving this talk. So, um, so I'm uh, affiliated with the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Coimbra, as well affiliated with the Center of Neuroscience and Cell Biology. So uh, in fact, um, as uh, it shows in the title, um, uh, this presentation, the first part of my presentation will be uh, focused in the the biological problem that we are trying to address using these biomaterials. And, and for this purpose, uh, we believe that these uh, light uh, or remotely uh, triggerable nanomaterials, like light triggerable nanomaterials, might be an interesting approach uh, for to address this biological question. So I'm going to give you uh, in the first part, uh, just a, a few, um, just a, a context about um, uh, the, the problem, and the problem is about uh, regenerative medicine, so about tissue regeneration. And I'm showing in here, um, in this first slide, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a general view about um, 
uh, what um, uh, human uh, has in terms of uh, tissue generation. So after we we um, we uh, born, uh, so we lose um, many um, possibilities to regenerate some of the tissues. So uh, looking for, for instance, as the heart, uh, we, we lose the, the capacity after a few days after we, 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 um, we are born. And, um, but there are some other, uh, other organs like liver and blood that uh, for some reason, it's, um, we are still able to uh, regenerate for uh, all our life. Um, but these contradicts uh, or this is, um, uh, it's not the same for all the species. So for instance, if we look for uh, non-mammalian non um, um, mammalians, uh, vertebrates like salamander or zebrafish, in fact, these uh, small animals, they have the capacity to uh, regenerate even for, I mean, for uh, all the life. So it's very impressive. And these uh, really inspire um, the uh, researchers and scientists around the world to somehow uh, to, be, uh, to use potentially the same principles uh, for um, in the case of human. And, um, and so how this happens? So the regeneration can, of course, uh, we need the new cells. We need uh, to uh, regenerate uh, um, uh, some loss of function, loss of activity of, uh, of a tissue. And so for these, we need to replace um, uh, cells that uh, have, uh, uh, have problems. And so in the case of human, uh, this happens essentially by uh, the differentiation of stem cells. These stem cells are um, in, in, in many organs uh, really locate in specific regions and they have the ability to self renew as well to differentiate in, uh, in uh, one or more type of cells. And this is what happens in human, but um, uh, there are other uh, principles and this happens uh, in the non-mammalian uh, vertebrates that uh, I show you before, like the zebra and uh, the salamander that um, in many cases, it's not involving the stem cells, but it's involving other biological principles. In this case, by the differentiation. So this means that um, these uh, uh, cells that are differentiated, they uh, become uh, a progenitor cell and this progenitor cell will have um, much more proliferation and, uh, uh, and will give rise to more uh, differentiated cells like the, the initial one but also by terms differentiation, meaning that uh, one cell type can become in a different cell type, okay? These, in fact, these two processes are um, the main uh, process uh, that um, are uh, somehow uh, uh, explaining the regenerative capacity of these uh, non-mammalian um, vertebrates that uh, I present before. But what happens in the in the in the adult humans? So um, uh, to to capitalize in stem cells is not a, a, a problem. The problem is we age, and like George was saying, that I'm becoming old. Uh, my stem cells also become old, and so they have uh, intrinsic. Um, so they lose some intrinsic properties. So they become. So they accumulate mutations. So they, uh, uh, so they, uh, at, um, uh, from uh, 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 signals that they receive from the niche and, uh, and others, they become um, with um, outer function. And so if they cannot really uh, replicate or uh, they have uh, problems in the differentiation, we have an issue in terms of um, regeneration. And so because of that, uh, since uh, the 50s, um, the paradigm in, in, uh, in uh, uh, regenerative medicine for many years now, so since uh, almost from the end of the Second World War, was, um, okay, so if we, our stem cells cannot really do a proper job, um, 
or because they age or because they have mutations or, or whatsoever. So why not to transplant uh, new cells in, uh, in, uh, in these patients? And so this was uh, the very beginning of the transplantations, for instance, of bone marrow in uh, 57 uh, as well. And then uh, it pushed the research uh, community to understand better the stem cell area and and so was the origin of the isolation of mouse embryonic stem cells. Uh, and, and after in 98, uh, by James Thompson, uh, by the isolation of human embryonic stem cells, and finally, uh, um, a few years back, uh, related to the generation of induced pluripotent stem cells. And so, and so the, the rationale here was uh, uh, to transplant uh, stem cells or uh, cells uh, derived from stem cells to uh, uh, replace um, uh, cells or tissues that have a lesion and they cannot really uh, generate the cells uh, that are necessary for, the for a, a specific function. In fact, uh, my group in, uh, is contributing for a clinical trial right now that is, the, in fact, the first uh, uh, research uh, clinical trial in, in the area of um, uh, cell therapies that is coordinated by uh, João Sargent Freitas. He's an MD at the Central Hospital of Universidade de Coimbra. And uh, this will be uh, for uh, stroke patients, so patients uh, that um, um, uh, do not respond to the current therapies that are reperfusion uh, therapies. And um, so in this case, uh, you will administer uh, uh, these uh, uh, progenitor cells called C34 positive cells uh, by intra-arterial administration. And then uh, the, the patients will be followed uh, uh, for um, uh, three months using uh, synesthetic magnetic uh, imaging and um, also um, uh, other tests. But one of the problems when we do cell transplantation is in fact the survival. In fact, um, after uh, uh, one week, uh, in many cases, in different uh, uh, disease models, using different uh, stem cells and uh, cells differentiation from stem cells, the pattern is um, in many cases similar. Th this means that uh, after one week, uh, uh, I will say that um, uh, 70, 80% of the cells in general, they die because they cannot really survive after transplantation. And so this is a, a, an important point. And um, we try to address this point using uh, factors that somehow push the survival chemicals that survive, that push the survival of these cells after the transplantation. But still, we are far away from uh, uh, creating the, the right uh, conditions to uh, really promote the survival of these cells after the transplantation. And so for these, we develop, um, uh, in, as I said in here, some chemicals like liso Phosphatidic acid, which is a natural um, chemical, um, so it's it's found in the human body, but also uh, capitalizing in bioengineering approach. So in this case, we mobilize um, vascular endothelial growth factor in uh, in the surface of uh, microparticles, magnetic uh, microparticles that um, uh, somehow uh, will um, could uh, stimulate. Uh, the VEGF signaling um, in these uh, endothelial cell aggregates. So the, the expectation in here was that uh, the VEGF immobilized in these microparticles will uh, stimulate, uh, will prolong the stimulation of uh, the VEGF receptor too. And this is a pro-survival signaling pathway in, in the endothelial cells. So this is the cell, these are the cell aggregates they become darker after we um, uh, encapsulate these uh, microparticles with VEGF. Uh, the darker uh, color is because of the microparticles that they have uh, this uh, dark color. 
Uh, and so uh, using this approach, um, uh, I'm, I'm making these uh, long story short, uh, we, we uh, increase significantly uh, the survival of uh, these endothelial cells. And so in here, uh, I'm showing in, um, in, uh, in uh, blue, uh, the cells uh, that are uh, treated uh, um, with uh, just the microparticles without VEGF. Uh, in orange, uh, treated with the soluble VEGF. So, uh, so cells, these aggregates treated with soluble VEGF. And um, in uh, Bordeaux, uh, the ones that are treated with VEGF uh, uh, microparticles. So, um, but again, uh, even using this approach, the survival is, is really not, um, as, as in many cases, so effective. And so we alter uh, our uh, paradigm. And, um, and the paradigm was based uh, in, the, in, in these. So why not to use um, endogenous uh, stem cell niche somehow to... Um, uh, to promote um, uh, regeneration. So rather than transplant uh, exogenous cells, uh, these stem cells or uh, progenies from these stem cells, why not to capitalize in these endogenous resource that we have in the human body? So as I mentioned, these stem cells are located in specific regions of the human body. So they have um, uh, these uh, uh, cells that support uh, the stem cells. So in here, uh, I'm showing the hematopoietic stem cell compartment. So this is uh, supported by osteoblasts, osteoclasts, macrophage. And we have in this uh, uh, compartment, in fact, uh, two types of uh, progenitor uh, uh, stem cells. So hematopoietic stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells. That are that receive uh, signals from all the body from through the the blood vessels, and so um, the idea here is what was to use biomaterials that we could somehow assess to these uh, stem cell niche and interfere with the, the biological properties of uh, the stem cells, meaning so to induce uh, proliferation or uh, potentially. Uh, differentiation, migration to the lesion site. So these uh, nanotechnologies, so for you to, uh, so for, for you might not be a, a novel issue, but uh, so these nanotechnologies have been used from the 70s. So the, the first um, uh, polymer-based nanoparticle was reported in 76. And then um, in, um, in the 2000 was the first uh, 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 report showing uh, the, the use of these nanotechnologies to modulate or to interfere with uh, uh, stem cells. Uh, uh, in 2005, it was approved the first protein-based nanoparticle by FDA. And, um, and since then, uh, there were a few examples of uh, the use of these nanotechnologies to control um, a stem cell activity that I'm highlighting in, in, uh, in this slide. And so far, the achievements that, uh, that have been done in the, in the last years was, uh, uh, there, was there are some uh, reports showing that um, using this kind of approach, using this nanotechnology-based approach, we can increase stem cell engraftment. Um, a second um, achievement was to show that it's possible to use these nanotechnologies, for instance, to reduce cancer cells in, in the niche, which is um, really a problem uh, for um, uh, for the uh, the 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 appearance of uh, secondary tumors. Um, and also we, we have evidence that using this approach, we have success in the proliferation and differentiation of stem cells. So what kind of signaling pathways can we uh, use for this purpose? So we can use different signaling pathways to control uh, stem cells. Um, so I'm, I'm showing here uh, three uh, important ones. Uh, so the notch, uh, wind and retinoic acid signaling. So in fact, my group 
uh, has been much uh, focus in the retinoic acid signaling. Uh, so in the case of retinoic acid, so the retinoic acid cannot really get inside of the cell without the transporter. So it's uh, these cause uh, uh, crap uh, proteins. Um, so they require the complexation with the protein to be transported to the, to the nucleum. Uh, and then to act in the receptors. So the receptors of proteinic acid are in the nuclei. And so um, after the ligation of the proteinic acid, there is uh, 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 alterations in the, in the genetic profiling, in the, in the, in the genetic uh, activity of the cell and then leads to um, uh, different programs in terms of uh, cell activity. Um, but also we can, of course, not just uh, do a direct uh, alteration of the stem cells, but uh, changing cells in the niche. So uh, in this case, we can also uh, modulate macrophage or other cell types that are in the niche. And so I'm showing here a few examples, but also alterations of oxygen levels uh, or, or, or uh, by changing of signaling molecules. So these are uh, um, uh, specific um, elements that we can play. So what kind of stem cells we elect for, for the, these proof of concept and for this demonstration? Uh, so we, we have them, so there are a few stem cell niche that we can use for this purpose that are very well identified and we know uh, for many years uh, now. Um, so besides the metopathic stem cell niche that I show you before, uh, that I'm going to show you an example in the, in the next few slides, uh, there are um, the neural stem cell niche, so that is uh, very uh, well uh, defined. So in two regions of uh, the brain, so the subventricular zone as well, the hippocampus. And so the stem cells are characterized by the expression of these markers, uh, the nesting positive or nesting positive GFAP positive cells. But also for instance, the skin, which uh, are identified by uh, the uh, the expression of uh, LGR5 uh, positive cells. So for the, the demonstration of, uh, of these um, uh, potential of these nanotechnologies, so we elect um, the, uh, so the subventricular zone in collaboration uh, with um, uh, João Malva and Liliana Bernardino, uh, we, we try to test uh, the potential of these nanotechnologies uh, uh, using these uh, niche uh, uh, for demonstration. So this niche is in fact very complex. So it, it comprises different type of cells. Uh, so they, they, they start to differentiate and then to migrate uh, through um, uh, the RMS to the olfactor uh, bulb, so to, to, to the nose. So they are uh, very important uh, for uh, the sensing uh, in the nose, um, but also they are important uh, if we have a lesion, uh, let's say an ischemic lesion by stroke, uh, these cells uh, are mobilized from the subventricular zone in order to replace uh, and to give rise to new neurons in the lesion sites. So this has been uh, uh, proof um, but to, to modulate this niche at the, 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 the uh, subventricular zone, of course, we need um, to deliver these uh, nanotechnologies in the, in the brain. And so this is a very, um, a very important issue. Uh, so we have different uh, uh, possibilities to do this. So one of them is by the intracerebral administration, which is invasive, but uh, also perform uh, in some case in the clinic. Of course, we can use the alpha um, uh, administration, so through the nose, um, but uh, uh, it's um, limited the success of the, these uh, nanoparticles to cross uh, and to reach this neurogenic niche. Also, we can use the, the bloodstream, so the, the systemic administration, so using uh, intravenous administration, which will be potentially more relevant from a, a clinical point of view. But 
the problem is uh, really to cross uh, the blood brain um, uh, blood brain uh, um, uh, region. So the, the the nanoparticles need to 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 to, to cross the vessels, and this is uh, in fact um, um, uh, a very um, difficult task for these nanotechnologies and then to reach uh, the, the, the neural stem cell niche and or potentially interfere with the, the components of niche or the stem cells. So the limitations so far that we have uh, for, for this uh, kind of uh, biological question is how we can use these nanotechnologies that we can really uh, perform uh, what we need to interfere with the, the, the biological programs of these stem cells. So they need to be safe. So we really need to know where they are and to, to control their activity. Second, we need to have um, nanotechnologies that are very efficient to overcome biological barriers. So this is a, an important issue. And also we need uh, to better understand how we can control uh, the activity of um, these um, uh, stem cells. So I show you some uh, signaling pathways, but there are many others that we really don't know and we really need to test uh, and we need to perturb um, these stem cell niche to understand better the biology. So one of the scientific questions that we try uh, to address uh, so, in the, um, and the, this came from the, uh, before even the RC projects, but um, uh, was very pushed by the ERC project was how to interfere with endogenous uh, uh, stem cell niche, um, which I'm also showing not just stem cells, but also uh, progenies from these uh, stem cells. So. There was um, uh, a large number of uh, members in my group that were really um, concentrating these questions. So, so for this, we develop um, uh, materials of what I call a first generation of nanomaterials, uh, somehow to address uh, these uh, three uh, acts that I showed you before. So safety, delivery, and perturbation. So we, we start by developing uh, nanomaterials that we could um, uh, use to uh, potential delivery signals that um, uh, became uh, um, very important uh, a few years ago. So these non-coding RNA, so the microRNAs. So we were one of the first groups uh, to report uh, a delivery system for microRNAs. So for this purpose, what we did was uh, to develop um, uh, these uh, 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 PLHA, uh, so polylactic glycolic acid uh, based nanoparticles, so uh, very established uh, nanomaterials, uh, so using a polyester. And, um, and so what we did was to coat these, uh, so we encapsulate uh, a fluorine um, uh, tracking system that we can used for magnetic resonance imaging. So these uh, prefrucuro uh, chrome eater. Um, and then what we did was uh, to coat these nanomaterials with uh, these uh, protein sulfate, which is a, a polycation uh, that exists uh, in, uh, in the human body. So in fact, is uh, used uh, to, um, uh, to wrap um, uh, DNA. Um, and so what we did was to coat these nanoparticles and then we uh, complex microRNA in the surface of these nanoparticles. So this shows that um, using a magnetic resonance imaging, we, we could track the nanoparticles inside of the cells. So we use as a proof of concept endothelial cells. So if we um, transfect endothelial cells with these nanoparticles, we can see the signal inside of the cells. And if the cells start to divide, uh, we start to lose a part of the signal because the nanoparticles become diluted in the, the cytoplasm of these cells. 
but if we inhibit the proliferation using mitomycin, we still keep the, uh, the signal inside of the cell. So showing that, in fact, the loss of the signal uh, was because of the cell proliferation. And this happens, uh, but the, the cells were able to keep uh, the, 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 the labeling, so these uh, fluorine uh, label for uh, seven days. But very importantly, this system was um, very efficient, in fact, to uh, transport microRNA inside of the cell. So we use, um, uh, uh, we were able to track. Uh, so if the microRNA is being processed inside within the cell, is, is, um, is being processed by this Argonaut 2. So it's a machinery that exists in the cell that is um, complex, the microRNA, and leads to the next stage of uh, the, the microRNA action. And so we were able to demonstrate that, in fact, these nanoparticles were very efficient, uh, as I show here by the quantification, to really deliver the microRNA within the cell. Um, so also by these first generation of nanomaterials, uh, we use um, uh, poly, uh, uh, polyplex, so where we use um, a polycation with the polyanions uh, to make uh, these uh, nanoparticles by nanoprecipitation. And so using this kind of simple approach, we could encapsulate um, uh, retinoic acid. So uh, as I show you, is a very important signaling pathway for uh, to control the activity of, uh, of stem cells. So we were able to form these uh, nanomaterials with it uh, in average of 200 nanometers in, in diameter. And, um, and uh, these nanomaterials, in fact, respond uh, to the pH. So once they are um, within, uh, and so the pH is very important because if the nanoparticles get inside of the cell uh, in the endolysosomal compartment, so we, we, in the vesicles, uh, so they are entrapping in vesicles inside of the cells, so these vesicles are acidic. And so uh, the expectation is that uh, these acidic uh, uh, properties somehow will uh, disrupt, will um, disassemble the nanoparticle. And so this is what happens. So when we have um, these nanoparticles in acidic conditions, they become, they will disassemble faster than at uh, um, uh, neutral or more uh, so uh, uh, at pH 7.4. So this is very convenient because once they get inside of this endolysosomal compartment, they can release the retinoic acid in, within the cell. So these, we, um, we show that these nanoparticles could be afterwards internalized by uh, neural stem cells and um, using um, specific concentrations of the, these nanoparticles, we were able to show that they can start the differentiation process of uh, these neural stem cells. So in here, uh, I'm showing uh, the results by looking for the expression of a marker of differentiation into neurons. This is very interesting because if we use retinoic acid soluble, we need um, uh, much higher concentrations of the retinoic acid to have the same kind of differentiation uh, profile. So meaning that these uh, nanoparticles could be very effective in delivering um, uh, high uh, uh, concentrations of retinoic acid inside of the cells. So, um, and this is by differentiation, I'm not, I'm going to skip details, but uh, uh, we show by at single cell level that this is in fact true. It's by uh, the differentiation of, of the cells. But after having demonstrated these uh, first generation of uh, uh, cells of nanomaterials, then we um, uh, become interested in these uh, uh, light uh, triggerable nano, uh, nanomaterials. So in these remote, remotely triggerable nanomaterials. And the reason was because of um, the safety, as I show you, was, it's a very important. Uh, so 
for translation purpose, we really need uh, these synthetic vectors that are really uh, only activated in the regions that we want. And, um, and so we, uh, uh, through the RC project, we thought that um, the light could be a very important um, uh, trigger because, um, because of three main reasons. One, connected to the biomedical history. So there is um, uh, uh, already in the clinic um, uh, products that explore light as a trigger. So this is the case of photodynamic therapy uh, that has been explored in the last, uh, uh, in the last 20, uh, 30 years. Uh, then because of the precision, so we can use the laser, so we can activate only the regions that are somehow defined by the laser. So this is also very important. So we can, even if the nanoparticles are uh, distributed around the, the body, only the ones that are activated by the laser will release uh, the biomolecule of interest. The third reason, uh, the reason is because of the multiplex, because using different uh, wavelengths, we can really um, release uh, different biomolecules. So uh, using uh, lasers with the different wavelengths, we can release at the different kinetics, uh, uh, multiple biomolecules. So this was uh, the, so, for, uh, so we generate these remotely triggerable, and I'm showing in here one of the examples where we uh, capitalize in the polymeric nanoparticles that were the polycatin was uh, uh, modified with this uh, photosensitive uh, molecule uh, called DMNC. And, and so they, they form a polyplex with the dextran sulfate. And so when we activate with the blue light, what happens is that um, this bond is cleave. And because of the cleavage of this bond, um, we uh, which lose this hydrophobic component, which is important for the assembly of the nanoparticle, uh, the nanoparticle disassemble because of the loss of this hydrophobic component. And so um, using this, we can really um, release, um, in this case, we use again, retinoic acid as a proof of concept. So these are the kinetics of the release. So in, uh, in a few minutes, we can uh, disassemble these nanoparticles. So they can, um, so I'm showing here in orange, the diameter of the nanoparticles. So they, they, they so this is in nanometers, so they, they lose uh, the size, the diameter, and um, they also the number of the nanoparticles decrease over time. And so this is the concentration of retinoic acid that we can release um, in, the, in, this, uh, in this timeline. But an important feature of these nanoparticles was their capacity to accumulate uh, in the in the lysosomal compartment of the cells. This is important if we want to tackle the stem cell niche because the idea here was a potential to use cells as the transporters to the stem cell niche. And so, um, so for that, we need the nanoparticles that uh, should accumulate in the endolysosomal compartment. And so, this is the, uh, an evidence, and uh, this was one of the first uh, um, studies showing that uh, capacity uh, of, um, of these cells to preserve uh, or to uh, accumulate these nanoparticles for a long time, at least for six days. And so this, uh, this is important if we want to reach, for instance, the hematopoietic stem cell niche. Typically, the cells take some time to reach the niche. So we show in uh, leukemia, uh, so we can use uh, hematopoietic uh, stem cells as a transporters, or even we can use uh, 
leukemic uh, and uh, cells. So the, the so for patients with uh, leukemia, we can use uh, the 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 disease to treat the disease. Okay, so this was the rationale. So potentially using leukemic uh, uh, cells uh, to so transfect uh, these leukemic cells, and then because they have tropism for the the bone marrow, we we could use these um, cells as a transport. And then, so this uh, is the evidence. So we use a bunch of different uh, leukemia cells to show that um, they can internalize these nanoparticles, and then. If we activate by um, a laser, we can release the retinoic acid inside. And so if we release retinoic acid inside, we can trigger the differentiation program of these cells. So in here, I'm showing uh, the differentiation program by the expression of CD11B, which is a marker of um, the differentiation into myelocytic uh, lineage. Um, well, uh, an important point is that these nanoparticles are really efficient to uh, release high dose of retinoic acid. It's like a bomb of retinoic acid inside of, um, of this cell. So uh, using um, uh, a tracer, radioactive tracer, we could show that, um, in fact, um, we can really load these cells with a very high dose as compared, for instance, using the same retinic acid encapsulating these nanoparticles, but soluble, we have much less retinic acid within the cell. Also, we, uh, because um, these uh, release the retinic acid without uh, any uh, control uh, by, uh, by, let's say, immobiliz immobilization of retinic acid. So we develop uh, also linkers to immobilize the retinoic acid. Uh, so we, using click chemistry, uh, we develop a different kind of linkers uh, that we could immobilize uh, the retinoic acid. And um, again, uh, using light, we could potentially uh, release the retinoic acid with much control. Because I forgot here to mention that, um, uh, as you can see here, some of these nanoparticles, so they have some leakness. So they leak some of the retinic acid because they, it's not immobilized inside of the, the nanoparticle. It leaks some of uh, the retinic acid. So this was to address this concern. So we, we could develop linkers that were very effective to uh, immobilize. And so these linkers were um, uh, really uh, activated by light in this case by blue light. Also, we develop a gel, uh, gels, either gels. Uh, so in this case, not just nanomaterials, but potentially using hydrogels that we could uh, inject in the, uh, in the stem cell niche. And in this case, uh, the component, the bioactive component was not uh, uh, small molecules like retinoic acid, but um, extracellular vesicles. So in this case, what we did was to immobilize uh, extracellular vesicles. Uh, so these extracellular vesicles are nanoparticles, biological nanoparticles secreted by cells, and um, which have uh, inside micronase as well, proteins that are very important for bioactivity. And so what we did was to immobilize these vesicles using this photocleavable linker um, and uh, so these photocleavable linker could uh, be could act as a linker to attach to hyaluronic acid. So we we make these shells of uh, hyaluronic acid where we could uh, immobilize uh, these vesicles. And so using a laser again, we can really disassemble the gel and release the these uh, extracellular vesicles. So shining. Uh, with multiple irradiation cycle, cycles or pools, we can uh, really release these vesicles over time. So uh, then we move uh, to a second generation uh, of um, um, light to triggerable materials. So in the first generation, we don't have um, uh, diversity. So we don't have high throughput. Uh, in the second generation, we 
we have throughput. So meaning that um, we can generate uh, um, hundreds of uh, materials, uh, in this case, nanomaterials, that uh, with the different physical chemical properties that have a different also sensitivity to respond to light, that disassemble to light, and um, able to release uh, uh, these bioactive uh, elements from... Uh, and so this is a library that we generate. So we have different libraries um, capitalizing in a Michael type addiction kind of reaction. So it's a very um, simple addition. So it doesn't require catalysts um, in order to make um, uh, a, a large uh, um, nanomaterials that we can use for, for this purpose. So using these, we uh, we synthesize some of the nanomaterials that were very efficient. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, six of them that were more efficient, several orders of magnitude than commercially transfection agents. And very importantly, when we shine the light, we have um, much higher uh, biological activity of these nanomaterials. So I forgot to mention these nanomaterials were used to deliver, in this case, non-coding RNA, so, or micronays or short interference RNA. And so why these nanomaterials were very efficient? Um, so one of the reasons was because of their capacity to escape the endolysosomal compartment, okay? So we have a reporter cell line where we could track these over time and we show that in fact, these nanomaterials get released from uh, these uh, indole as a small compartment and release um, uh, micronates uh, as well, short interference nanites in the cytoplasm. So this is a, an illustration for one of the hits and the comparison with the lipofectamy showing that we have much higher efficiency. But why we need the diversity? We need diversity also because we can capitalize in that diversity to um, target specific cell populations. So only based in the physical chemical properties of the, these nanomaterials. So without using specific uh, ligands to interact with specific receptors in the cells. So we basically use this diversity potentially um, to uh, with the expectation that some of the nanomaterials will be more e e efficient to target uh, specific cell populations. And so, for instance, as a title of example, so for one of the formulations, for instance, this P1C7, uh, we were able to show that they, they are more internalized by fibroblasts and keratinocytes than, for instance, endothelial cells. Um, but then, uh, these ones were um, uh, triggered by blue lights or UV lights. But um, as you know, the, the penetration efficiency is uh, limit. And so we, we move to another set of nanomaterials that were um, uh, sensitive to near infrared light. So in this case, we capitalize in gold nanorods, so in organic nanomaterials that were derivatized with um, oligonucleotides. So, um, so they were um, immobilized through the five prime uh, end terminal uh, with the polythene sequence. And then we had the, the sequence of interest that will hybridize with um, uh, a complementary sequence that was conjugated to the, the microRNA or short interference RNA of interest. So we use a natural process of hybridization that happens in our DNA to immobilize uh, uh, biomolecules in the surface of these nanomaterials. And then we backfill uh, the nanomaterial with the PEG in order to make these less, um, uh, to, I mean, to, uh, to prevent the sorption of proteins and other elements in the surface of the, 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 the nanomaterial. And so we were able to show I'm not showing here the in vivo data, but we have in vivo. Uh, in vitro, uh, we show that um, if we transfect cells with the uh, uh, nanomaterials that have um, uh, two different microRNAs, one that leads 
uh, to survival and the other to proliferation, we were able to show that uh, using specific uh, pools with uh, specific powers, okay, at the same wavelength, so the wavelength that these nan nanomaterials absorb, that it's at 780 nanometers, we were able to show that um, uh, using uh, oligonucleotides that have uh, different melting points, melting temperatures. So as you, as you know, when we shine in the infrared at 780 nanometers, these gold nanorods transform uh, the infrared light in temperature. And so the temperature will dezebridize uh, this uh, sequence and will release the micronite. And so we were able to show that um, using these uh, with the different powers, we were able to, to uh, desibridize selectively uh, one of the micronase compared to the other, or both if we use large powers. Okay. And so because of that, these, we can uh, induce survival or uh, proliferation or both. Okay. So this is what this tells. So this is very um, uh, precise kind of technology to release uh, biomolecules inside. Also, we, um, we are, uh, um, have uh, submitted recently um, also a technology that is based in upconversion nanoparticles. So in this case, we use um, um, uh, nanoparticles to absorb uh, at 980 nanometers. Uh, that can, uh, uh, after absorb, uh, emit um, in the blue uh, range. And so uh, the blue light that they emit, we hope that they could somehow um, uh, delete so they, they can degrade uh, these, um, I'm so sorry, these uh, photoclippable linker that we introduce in here that um, uh, we mobilize um, a protein called CRIF recombinance that is very important for gene editing uh, purpose. Yeah. So using these, we can uh, in a few minutes release this uh, enzyme that we can really uh, manipulate the DNA. So we were able to show these in the neurons. So um, these using a reporter system. Uh, so basically, what uh, this CRI does is uh, uh, to eliminate these log P sequence. And so because of that uh, leads to um, the expression of GFP. And so this shows that most of the cells get uh, edited, uh, in this case, uh, by a recombination strategy. And um, we show these also in neurons. Um, so using cortical neurons, um, which is very, but very difficult to transfect. And I'm showing uh, in the end of my presentation why we need these. Uh, so we are using these for gene editing in the brain. A second question is how to overcome biological barriers uh, to uh, deliver nanoformulations to specific niche. So we work in, in close collaboration with the uh, clinicians. So in this case, with uh, um, a neurologist to understand better how we can really um, penetrate the BBB, so the blood brain barrier. Uh, so I'm showing here some, some of the biological molecules that we can use to, to somehow uh, control the permeability of the BBB. Uh, but also we use these light triggerable nanomaterials to somehow to increase the temperature, like uh, somehow recapitulating what we have when we have fever, right? So when we have fever, our BBB, it's more primitive to, to, to the crossing of uh, molecules to the brain. And so the expectation in here was uh, somehow to use these nanomaterials that increase the temperature after the light activation to, um, to make the, the, the BBB more primitive. And so this, what, this uh, is the, the confirmation of this. So if we use this concentration of the, these nanomaterials, um, uh, we have um, much higher permeability of the BBB. Uh, so we use a, a, a BBB that we developed in, in my lab. So human-based human, human -based, uh, BBB. 
Um, and then if we, um, if we increase the permeability, the, the, the cells are able to recover after um, some time and reestablish again um, the integrity of the BBB. So this is already in animals. So showing that um, uh, very interestingly that we can really increase the permeability in more specific regions. So in this case, in the neurogenic niche. So if we trigger using these lights, uh, so these nanomaterials were uh, modified with transferrin uh, peptides, so able to target the transferrin receptor. And we see in here that in fact, these nanomaterials are very efficient uh, to, uh, or more efficient than the ones without um, uh, or the controls and the, the others uh, conditions to, to target uh, the neural stem cell niche. Uh, and again, um, after targeting and after opening the BBB, uh, the BBB is able to establish after 24 hours. So this is in animal studies. So what we did was to inject these nanoparticles, uh, irradiate after one hour, and then um, after uh, uh, one hour, uh, pause irradiation uh, to prefuse uh, the animal and to see the location. Um, and in, in other experiments to see the opening, we, we led for 24 hours to see if the animal was able to reestablish the BBB. But also very important, um, using this kind of technology, uh, we can also use uh, cells or stem cells as a transporting uh, system. So this is the first uh, evidence that uh, we can use, uh, in this case, leukemia cells to transport uh, nanomaterials, then we can irradiate the nanomaterials after they reach the bone marrow. And so uh, we are still doing further testings that I'm not showing here. And this is, was the first uh, study showing that in fact, it's possible to do this in the, in the niche. Uh, and this is opens a new approach to treat uh, 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 cancer in uh, related to um, to, to the hematopoietic stem cell niche. So we can uh, really deliver uh, biomolecules inside of the bone marrow. Um, so this is a proof of concept. So what we did was to transfect uh, these leukemia cells with the, the nanoparticles, then uh, in, in the tail of these uh, mice, and then we wait for six days and then uh, we irradiate, in this case, the cranium, um, the calvaria, because it's a very thin bone, so we, uh, the, this blue light can penetrate. And so we, we show that um, these cells start to differentiate after we shine the, the light, because they release the retinoic acid and they start to differentiate these transporting cells. Finally, another question that we uh, try to target is what we basically what we have learned by the in vitro and in vivo perturbation of the molecular program of stem cells and other cell populations. And so, one of the the, the one of the things that we learned so far is um, that um, using these kind of systems, um, uh, we can perturb the the stem cell niche, but in in aspects that we um, in, in, we didn't predict when we initially uh, performed this study. So, uh, so for instance, when we use these uh, leukemia stem cells uh, or uh, initiating cells as a transporting system, um, what we found is that these uh, cells start to release retinoic acid inside of the, the niche, not because they secrete the retinoic acid uh, uh, afterwards from the cytoplasm, but because they release extracellular vesicles in rich in the retinoic acid. So these transporting cells, when they reach the bone marrow, they release the component, the retinoic acid that is uh, entrapped in the nanoparticles, released by the nanoparticles, by these vesicles. And this is very interesting because this can open new opportunities to treat also uh, disease in the in the hematopoietic stem cell uh, niche. Another thing is um, we were also able 
to uh, study in more detail the uh, cellular uh, program of this differentiation. So uh, in the niche, we were able to show that um, these retinic acid nanoparticles were able to differentiate uh, these uh, neural stem cells uh, by uh, triggering the expression of uh, these uh, uh, master genes like MASH1 and neuroglin one also, uh, we are um, also able to, using these uh, systems, uh, to control um, the, the properties of the, 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 the stem cells. And so this is a proof of concept. So initially in vitro, uh, uh, we did uh, some studies showing that they, they can uh, do uh, very efficiently the, the addition of uh, the cells. But then also we did in vivo, showing, so we inject uh, these nanomaterials with the CRI recombinase, and we show that we are able uh, to edit uh, the neural stem cell niche compartment using these nanomaterials. And using these, um, also we can uh, use these uh, to uh, somehow control the animals, so the behavior of animals. So using a, an optogenetic uh, kind of system uh, and making a long sh uh, story short, uh, we can really uh, control uh, the behavior. In this case, the reward kind of compensatory mechanisms in the animal. So what we did was uh, to in the VTA, so we inject the, these uh, gene editing systems in the VTA. So it's a reward uh, part of the brain. And so, um, uh, so these nanoparticles are able to uh, edit uh, these cells to express channel rhodopsin. And channel rhodopsin can be afterwards triggered by a blue laser. So this is a, a protein that responds to light. And when responds to light, uh, it's a uh, it's uh, a poor uh, so it it's um it's a uh, transported um, protein so leads to the to the entry of uh, calcium and sodium and it stimulates these cells so these neurons so it depolarizes uh, uh, the the neurons and because of the polarization we can control the activity of neurons and so what we did was a, a condition experiment so basically. We put animals, so the animals in a cage in, with the two uh, kind of uh, compartments. And so we um, uh, uh, try to understand in which compartment the mice has more uh, tropies. And so what we did was in the one that he didn't select, so let's say in the back part of the cage, we activate with the laser. And so because was not the favorite place of the animal, after the activation, the animal then select uh, the region that was not initially the selected uh, uh, or the preference uh, region of the cage, showing that uh, we could activate the neurons uh, uh, that are uh, really um, initiating this kind of reward mechanism in that animal. So this was uh, performed uh, in collaboration with Jean Pess at uh, uh, CNC. So we have in here for the first time the possibility to do gene editing and at the same time to study at the single cell level uh, at the activity of uh, dead cells. And so we are very excited with this and we are um, really doing further testing to validate uh, the, these um, this technology. So as a conclusion, so I hope to convince you that um, we, these remotely triggerable formulations can really very nicely modulate stem cell activity. Uh, and uh, the modulation of this stem cell activity offers a promising therapeutic regenerative approach. Uh, we can really combine gene editing with optogenetics uh, to interrogate, interrogate cellular circuits. And this is a very important uh, point to study uh, also um, biology from a fundamental point of view, but also 
has also, of course, ethical concerns because we can really use these uh, really to perturb and, and uh, uh, the neural uh, circuits. Um, and also uh, it shows that um, we, of course, we need um, much more progress uh, uh, to target these, uh, uh, these formulations to the, to the right cells. We are doing, we have done already progress, but we still require um, more progress to overcome these, uh, uh, essentially these biological barriers. And so I wanted to acknowledge, so all, all the members of my group and, and collaborators, there are many uh, from different parts of the country, as well from abroad, um, involving also uh, clinicians uh, and um, and also um, uh, different uh, 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 from uh, also from companies that are not in, in this slide, and also the funding uh, of different uh, uh, research programs. Thank you, and I'm I'm, I'm happy to accept uh, or to respond to your questions. So, oh, Lino, thank you very much. Really impressive talk. And very, very uh, important contributions for the field. So, we have time for a few questions, please. I, I have one. May I put one? So, yeah, Lino. sure, please. Yeah, okay. Hi, George. Uh, Hi. <laughs> Lino, thank you very much for the impressive talk. I have one question regarding the, the, the wavelength of the light that you presented for this, for triggering the, the release of, uh, of the compounds, I guess it was the RA. Uh, you mentioned that you, you have made some tests with UV and blue uh, laser. Uh, um, if this is correct, so do you have uh, then any issue in terms of applications related with the wavelength? So how this could penetrate in the tissues or how this could damage the tissues? I also noticed that you mentioned something about the converting particles, but uh, so my question was about the UV and the blue uh, light for treating the release. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, we um, so we we did uh, uh, of course the tests before uh, to show that uh, the the exposure time as well the. Uh, the frequency that uh, the, the wavelength that we are using it's, uh, was not uh, uh, it didn't induce uh, lesion in, in the cells. Um, mm -hmm. um, so uh, so we we did uh, uh, a bunch of tests in vitro as well also in vivo showing that in it's uh, in the conditions that we test uh, was there was no lesion. Okay, so it was not uh, um, detrimental for for the cells. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, uh, uh, we, uh, the blue is more, uh, in, in many cases, we use the blue, not the, the, the UV light. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Thanks. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi. Hi, Paul. George. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How are you? Thank you, Lino. It was a wonderful talk. Thank As you. Usual. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm also curious about light, like bluish. And, uh, First, about an idea that you presented of using different colors to activate different things. Yeah. Um, how far have you, have you ex explored yeah. these? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. We didn't. So, so the possibility is there, but we didn't. Um, what to we show is that um, uh, using, for instance, um, uh, for instance, the so we have a, a, a nanomaterial response, and of course to near infrared, so nine eighty. Uh, so um, and um, but we didn't explore so to address a specific biological question. But that, that's a very important. That's a, that's very yeah. interesting. Um, yeah. About the blue light, okay, my questions are about penetration, but of course you know that. Yeah. It's limitation, but it's Limit. something you yeah. can do about it. Yeah. And um, just to finish, if I may, Josh. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. Regarding sure. the conversion of particle, yeah. I'm yeah. curious about on, on the, 
if the em emission of the a convergent nanoparticle would be enough to um, to degrade a, a bond or to to have an action because they absorb light but they emit isotropically so my feeling is that the intensity will be very low okay Indeed. what what are your thoughts on that yes no it's a very good question to say um so it is so the according to our uh we did some i didn't show but we we did um, um we did quantify um the conversion um and it's um around two percent uh, so but still we 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 uh, we were able to sh to see the degradation of uh, the linker. Um, so because it's very close to the surface. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. The question is, if it's because of the a converted wavelength or the intensity of the excitation wavelength? If you want uh, to high, high, high intensity, I, I guess, I don't know. That's a good point. Um, we don't have um, experimental data to um, to eliminate the second hypothesis that you are saying. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was very nice your talk. Yeah. Thank you. More Thank questions? You. I have a question, Maya. Yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you for the very interesting uh, and uh, cutting edge topic in which you are working. My point is about the use of uh, light in order to overcome the, the BBB. How efficient is the, is the process? Do you have any data about it? Yeah, no, it, it, so, um, so according to our experience and we did um, a bunch of uh, in vivo studies with the different um, um materials and um, and even with the vesicles uh, so we're using uh tracking systems um even pets and and others uh, efficiency is very low so uh typically it's um according to our experiences below one one percent so uh, uh, the initial dose that we inject less than one percent is uh, accumulates in the brain you know, so in here we increase the efficiency uh, uh, twofold relatively to the to the initial uh, um, success or to the initial accumulation. So even so, it's low, um, but um, it's uh, it's uh, two folds from uh, without any perturbation of the BBB. Um, so the, the it, it's very it's still very difficult to to overcome um, using this kind of uh, uh, biophysicals or uh, you know manipulation of the BB. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? No. Okay. Lino, thank you very much again thank for you. a terrific presentation and congratulations for your work. So thank you all for your for attending this seminar. Thank we'll you. We'll be back in one month okay. <laughs> for the next <laughs> seminar, okay? Thank, thank you so much for the invitation. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.